Hey guys, Dr. Alex here, and today we're gonna do another patient profile video where I'm gonna talk about a case that I had in the office and talk about a few takeaways from it that I think will be beneficial to you, the viewer. And today I've got a case fresh from this morning. We're gonna be talking about, we'll call her Sarah. Sarah is a uh, relatively new patient that I have that's not new to chiropractic. She was a senior chiropractor elsewhere in the city. And the reason that I'm gonna talk about her, she emailed me last night late in the night, well not late, like five o'clock on a Sunday and said, Alex, Dr. Alex, my shins are killing me. I need to come into the office. Please fix me. Yada, yada, yada. So with, we're calling her Sarah. Yeah, Sarah with Sarah. So we saw her last week. We checked her spine. We're going through a care plan to help her with some issues she's having with her spine nervous system. And she is new to running. She is running for the first time in a while, maybe ever, because she's uh, training and wants to do the police test or the police examination. So running is a component of that. So when we saw her last week, she was having lots and lots of calf tightness. And what we did was we, of course, checked her spine, made some corrections where necessary. Uh, we modified her gait and I told her, okay, next time you're in, make sure you bring in your shoes so that I can take a look at them. So we did that. Uh, we also did some uh, neuro, neurofunctional or electroacupuncture to the calves, try and reset those so she could run over the weekend. So I get this email, I see her last patient today. She tells me shin pain is excruciating and what she looked up online, she thought it was shin splint. So the good news was that it wasn't full blown shin splints where on the inside of the tibia or the inside of the leg, about midway up, there wasn't that obvious uh, change in the bone or the insertional bone pain that you get with shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome, medial tibial stress syndrome slash shin splints. That is when the flexor digitorum muscle, the toe flexors, and maybe the tibialis posterior in the leg, that's when they yank, 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 and they yank repeatedly on the periosteum or the wrapping around the bone, and they cause a stress fracture-like injury to the bone. So that's what shin splints is, pain on the inside of the shin on the medial border of the tibia, and sometimes it really results in a stress fracture-like scenario, medial tibial stress syndrome, MTSS. So in this case, the reason that Sarah's shins were excruciating was that the muscles that uh, help control and stabilize the foot, that flexor digitorum and the tibialis posterior, they were basically in spasm for lack of a better word and were yanking on that periosteum or the tibia, uh, the bone there in the leg. So good news was, was a full bone shin splints, but well on its way if she continues to push those tissues beyond what they're capable of. So we checked her spine, we made sure everything was working well. She was very good from last week. And then we know there are a few uh, risk factors for shin splints. So one of them super obvious is calf, is calf girth. If somebody has a very, very, very thin um, uh, tibia or the bone of the legs are really small, when you have more force concentrated on a smaller area, then that's when you're more likely to have shin splints because more force is yanking on a smaller bone. The repetitive strain is greater than what the tissue can tolerate. Another thing that we see with shin splints is if there's a lot of rotation inward of the tibia or the tibia is rotating too much. So with Sarah's leg, I checked her knee, got it up, and rotation in the shin was good. It was an adequate amount, wasn't excessive. We also checked her glutes, gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and made sure that they were activating properly. And the reason I did this is it was shin splints. We know if there's too much inward rotation of that tibia, which can also be a byproduct of the glute muscles and the hip, then you're more likely to have it. So we checked her spine, we checked her glutes, we checked her knee, we checked her ankle, and I couldn't find any reason why she might have this problem. So the calves I get, like if you're running and you're new to it, then typically, you know, calves are going to be tight because they're just not used to taking on two to five times your body weight with any step with running. But then I looked at her shoes and they sucked. Like they were, they were like running shoes, but they were not good running shoes. So I've got a few pairs of running shoes from our closet. These are all my partners. And so they were kind of similar to this running shoe. 
and I hate this running shoe. You know, this talk might be not be as useful if you're a triathlete, if you're a really advanced runner, if you can tolerate with very, very good technique and years of building a repetitive strain, tolerate a minimis, a minimal type shoe that you can bend in half, twist in half, and that provides very little support or shock absorption. Her shoe looked like this. And so what I said was, okay, Sarah, so with every step, force is going in to the bottom of your foot. So we have, you know, Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So every time you land with two to five times your body weight, two to five times your body weight's going into the ground and shooting back up into the shoe. And so that force needs to go somewhere. And this is why we wear shoes so that they can absorb some of that force. And then when the, the rest of the force that's not absorbed by the shoe, we want to make sure that the big muscles in the buttock and or maybe around the knee are absorbing some of that force so that it's not being directed into the bone, into the tibia, i.e. shin splints. So what I explained to her was, if you don't have a shoe that's absorbing enough force, that force is just going to shoot up potentially right into the tibia and or a knee and you're going to resultingly have an issue, especially if the tissues are not capable of it. So what I showed her was when I checked her shoe, I did this. I pushed into her shoe and, you know, it basically collapsed down so that there's very, very, you know, I'll get it nice and close here. Let's see if we can do this. So when I pushed in, you can see that the shoe collapses in and there's not much absorption here in the first place. I'm going to show you another pair of shoes where it's a little more obvious. So what I did was... Step number one, I pushed in here on the side of the shoe, and hopefully you can see that the shoe really collapses inwards. So when I do it with a little more force, you can see there's quite a bit of collapse there in the shoe. So that's one of the tests that I'll go through with patients. I will check the outside and I will check the inside, and you'll see on the inside, there's a little bit less. So there's still some life in these shoes. But with Sarah's shoes, they just collapse. So if the shoe is not absorbing that force, i.e. it deforms too much, that force is gonna shoot right up into the leg, might cause too much repetitive strain. The other test I did with Sarah was, I went to bend her shoe. And so you can see with this A6, we only have bending in the toe box and that's where you'll have that spring or that push off from the toes when you are towing off or taking a step. With hers, I can bend them in half. So again, there's very little sock shock absorption by the shoe and very little stability or motion control so that the muscles in the foot and in the leg are having to do a lot of the work. With shin splints, we talked about that flexor digitorum muscle that flexes the toes. You can imagine that if you have this shoe on, when you go to push off, you don't have to push as hard with those toe flexors because the shoe kind of naturally propuls, uh, propels itself. With this one, because it just folds, the foot muscles have to do so much more with each step to push you off i.e. more repetitive strain on that muscle, more repetitive strain on the bone. And then the last thing I showed her was that with her shoes, you could basically rotate them and twist them in half. And this is just another show uh, to that there's very little uh, lateral stability or lateral control, which is not gonna help one reduce the risk of an ankle sprain, um, but in general is not going to control that uh, outer heel to big toe motion during the push off where you're kind of landing on the outside, rolling over to the big toe and pushing off. No help, no control there. So when you check your shoes, what we should be doing is we should be examining the outside of the shoe where we're pushing in. And now this one, there's a little bit too much give. If I get another one of Jackie's shoes, you'll see that with this one, there's less deformity. These are brand new shoes. It deforms somewhat, so you know that the shoe is going to absorb some of the force from the impact, but 
it's not falling in all the way and thus not shooting force up into the leg. You can see on the inside here, very little collapse, enough collapse that it's going to absorb some force. But you know, I'm pushing with a little bit of weight. If you're landing with two to five times your body weight and you're bottoming out here, then that force you know is going to shoot up into the leg. So we check the outside. We can check the toe box to make sure that we're going to get some support there without a lot of motion. Like I can't really bend the shoe here in the middle. And then we also check the amount of rotation and we have some inner outer control. So those are the three tests that I did with Sarah and we found that her shoes failed every single one and that likely because her shoes were not providing enough control and support, we can guess that more force is going to shoot up into her leg. So with her, I did do some acupuncture after I checked and corrected her spine and we did some acupuncture through the flexor digitorum muscles and through the tibialis posterior to try and take them out of that spasm state. So they stop yanking on the bone and so that hopefully after she buys a new pair of shoes today, she's going to be able to do her uh, examination, whenever that is, and her runs that are coming up. So the really important thing to take away is today, those are the three tests we do to check our shoes. There should be a little bit of indentation when you check the heel on the inside and the outside. But if you're able to collapse it with your hands, those shoes have got to go. Typically, a shoe is going to last anywhere from 400 to 800 kilometers. And uh, you should definitely keep track of it. If you're a bigger, heavier person, more force goes through them. They don't last as long. If you're a East African runner with amazing technique, you land really softly, you don't have a lot of weight. Heck, you might get 500, 600, 700, 800 kilometers out of that shoe. One of the best things that you can do is when you buy a pair of shoes, especially if you know you like them, buy two pairs. And for every time uh, you're going to go for a run, you wear one pair five times and the other pair the sixth time or the seventh time or the fourth time. But you want to have a fairly big spread around five times to one time. And so if you start to notice that you're five times running shoe, that you wear five times for every one time you wear the other, when that one starts to feel different than your one time a week or that one time running shoe, that's when you probably need to toss them. And so you'll probably notice that that's around 400 to 800 kilometers uh, of running might be sooner, might be later, but that's going to be your typical range. And that's a really good way to check if you need to toss your shoes or if you start noticing your knees are a little more sore, or things are feeling different after you run, toss them, buying a new pair of shoes. Yes, it's expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than coming to see me to fix a problem that develops over days, months, weeks, or years. And uh, it just, you know, it's going to make sure you stay injury free and can keep running. So, those guys are the three tests that I do to check a pair of shoes that you can do at home. If you have shin splints or have another run, running injury, you got to make sure it's not your shoes. It's just the cheap, easy way. If you've changed your shoes, if your running technique for the most part is landing on the middle of the foot as opposed to the heels or maybe the toes, if that doesn't get it, that's where you want to make sure that there's not an underlying problem with the spine, the nervous system, the hip and or your running gait. So that's where you want to maybe work with a coach on your running gait if you're really serious about running or work with somebody uh, like me or somebody else that specializes in running um, to make sure that the body's functioning as it should. So that's what I got for you guys today. I hope it was helpful. I hope the close-ups next to the camera turn out, uh, turn out good and that you can see how much collapse is reasonable. I would say typically like that's a good amount of collapse underneath the shoe and then if it's more like this when you push in, give them a toss. So guys, Dr. Alex signing off. I hope you can like and subscribe, share this video with your running friends if they need it. And until then, you guys take care, be safe, and uh, I hope running injury free. Bye-bye.